All right, grab your Bibles, open them up, turn to Psalm chapter 34. That's where we're going to be as we continue sort of talking about our good uh, God. And we're going to be in Psalm chapter um, 34 uh, as we do that. Hopefully you all had a, a great Thanksgiving week. You got to spend time with your family. You got to give thanks to the Lord. Um, you had a, uh, a good week and uh, hopefully a great holiday. I know I was talking to some of you and you were talk, talking about how already families been, to, been able to make their way back home. I know several people that we have that are out of town that are making their way back in town. And um, this is just one of those holiday weeks. But I love the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, I love it, not just because of the, the time that I get to thank the Lord, but I love it for the time that I get to spend with family. And I love it because of the, all the delicious food that we get to eat. Amen? How many of y'all were just blessed this year by some wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving food? Not, not just a few of y'all. Or you were so blessed, you're like, I can't move right now. I don't want to talk, Pastor Craig. Don't make me do this. Um, but God is good. All the time. And all the time. And it was just evident through Thanksgiving, for, through my Thanksgiving holiday, with the time I got to spend with my family, uh, with the time that I, I got to sit down and eat, and even all the food that I got to consume. Uh, God's goodness, we talked about this last week, is evident in everything. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. So guess what? That macaroni that Mona made for Thanksgiving showed me that God is good all the time. and all the time. So let me ask you this. What, I just want to know this. What was your favorite thing that you consumed in your mouth that was a food object for Thanksgiving? Somebody tell me right now. Dinner rolls. Dinner rolls. And, you know, I saw, I saw an interesting post. It just, I mean, I just took a total chase to squirrel. I saw an interesting post, and it had this giant, enormous Thanksgiving dinner sitting down, and then it had a guy holding a roll next to it. And it goes, what we all want. And then it had the roll and said, what the kids want. <laughs> the rolls. I love rolls too. I'm with you. I praise God for rolls because God is good. All the time. And all the time. Yes. Something else. What else? What's the name? Something. Yes, sir. Back there. Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. God is good. All and all the time. Yes. Somebody else give me something. Everything Carolyn made. Everything your wife made. God is good. And all the time. How about dressing with ocean spray cranberry sauce? Dressing with ocean spray cranberry sauce. God is good. And all the time. Somebody give me a dessert. I've been waiting for some. Well, give me some. Yes, ma'am. Apple pie. Oh, goodness. God is good. And all the time. What would you say? Sweet potato pie. Oh, God is good. And all the time, God is good. Pecan pie. Oh, man, God is good. And all the time. All right, one more. Apple duck cake. Oh, God is good. And all the time. And, you know, we look at these things, and many of us, we can sit around like, if I decided right now, I just wanted you all to come up and just testify about your favorite dessert. How many of you just could? I mean, just come up. Not only would you just testify about the apple dump cake or the apple pie, you could testify about even the ingredients that were in it, all the little tastes that come with it. You know, I had, you know, there's something that I really don't like, and I never have, and that's blueberries. I just don't like blueberries. But I went down to that Edom Thanksgiving community, and I saw this blueberry pie. And I looked at it, and it was very picturesque, you might say. It's like, you know, when you see a picture, some people do a great job of taking pictures of food. And it's just, I mean, when you see a picture of a McDonald's cheeseburger, you know that don't look so well. It's not what it looks like when it comes out in the package. <laughs> this pie looked like, I mean, straight off of a billboard. And I was like, I don't like blueberries, but I want to eat that pie. And I did. I took it, and let me tell you, that was the absolute best blueberry pie I've ever eaten in my life. It's also the first. But it was really good, right? It was also really good. And, and that was just something. But when you get something like so good that you just, you know, you talk about like Mona's macaroni. Oh, my goodness. Everybody in the family is like, Mona, make your macaroni. Make your macaroni. And she makes it. 
And when you get it and you see it, it's just like, first of all, just like this layer of cheese, toasted to perfection on the top, right? And, and, and when you dip down in it, it is just like, it almost just squirts out the top a little bit with like cheese juice that runs over the top, you know? And then you scoop it out, it just begins to stream out as you just put it up. I mean, you have to actually have scissors to cut the strings of the cheese as you lay it on the plate. And some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about, whether it be Mona's macaroni, you know, or your wife's cooking. There's just these Thanksgiving meals, and we could talk about them all day long. But why can't we talk about Jesus like that? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I mean, you can talk about your grandma's pumpkin pie all day. <coughs> or even talk about your favorite restaurant that you like and all the good things about it. Oh, why do some of us struggle so much just in a casual conversation talking about Jesus? When we get into Psalm chapter 34, I want you to understand this is a, a Psalm of David written out of a cave experience like he was running from a Philistine king and running from Saul, um, the king of, uh, of Israel at that point in time. David's running for his life. It comes right out of 1 Samuel chapter 21. And David had just pretended and, that he was a madman to sort of escape the grip of this Philistine king and, uh, you know, slobbering all over the place. And this king's like, I don't need another madman. Get him out of here. We're done with David. And this is David. This was after Goliath had been killed. You know, he he should have. You know, just for, for the Philistines, he should have had a, a bounty on his head. But they just got rid of him. They're like, we're not dealing with this guy. He continues to hide from Saul, who's trying to chase him down and kill him. And he finds himself in this cave, and he finds his this a salvation experience. Like God saves him out of all of this that he is going through. This is where he writes Psalm chapter thirty-four. This is where we get this. And one of the reasons that many Christians love Psalm chapter 34 is because when you begin to read it, it also, when you put, your, put yourself in David's place and how you know that, you know, before Christ, you were trapped in the grip of darkness, like you were dead in your trespasses and sin. And God reached down and pulled you out of that darkness and set you into his marvelous light. And when you begin to think about that and you read this psalm, you can make it very personal to your own salvation experience. And so follow along as we look at this and we read Psalm chapter 34. We're going to go down to verse 8 and we look at how David felt about God's goodness and his grace. And it says in verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth, my, my soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I, I sought the Lord. And he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, so thankful for the refuge that we find in you. We are so thankful for the forgiveness and grace that we find through your son, Jesus. We are so thankful that in you we have salvation and that you, you seal us and you hold us. And we have nothing to fear because you are our refuge. You are our strong tower. You are all that we have to hope in. And we thank you for that. And Father, we thank you for the testimony here that we read of David and how that you were those same things in his life. And Lord, just how we need to be like him. And so this morning, as we continue to just look at this scripture, Father, may you lay it upon our heart. May you show us that we need to do better. Do better at proclaiming your praises. Lord, we thank you. 
In Jesus' name, amen. So we look at Psalm 34 here, and as we look at these eight, eight verses, I just want to talk to you today about living a life of evangelism. Like, we need to be sharing the gospel. The gospel, as the Apostle Paul says, is the power to salvation done to all men. All right? This, is the, this gospel message, this good news about Jesus, we need to be sharing with everybody. And when you've experienced it, you know, when you've truly tasted it, oh, it should be easy to actually verbalize it and paint a picture of how good God is. You know, it's one thing to just know it. It's another thing to really see it and experience it. That's what Job said. If you remember in Job chapter 42, verse 5, he said, I heard of you by the hearing of ears. Like, yeah, I heard about God, and I know, I, I know the things about you, but now my eyes see you. Like, there, he has fully experienced God's grace in the midst of that tragic time in his life, and he has this whole new appreciation for who God is. And so today, when we look at Psalm 34, what can we learn from it about living a life of evangelism? Well, the first thing I want us to look at is I believe we need to learn to have a, a constant witness. Like we are called, right, to be witnesses. This witness is a constant witness. We are a constant witness on behalf of Christ. When you go back and you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the, the scripture tells us Jesus told his disciples, he says, you're going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. He will come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. That, is what, that was the, They're going to be the witnesses for Christ. He's giving them the Holy Spirit. They're going to be witnesses to that power. They are witnesses to the resurrection. They are our witnesses to that. And for us, we need to be a constant witness of that grace that we've experienced. Like, if you are here today and you truly have experienced God's grace in your life, you've truly experienced that freedom, that you have been ripped from darkness and set into this marvelous light of his holiness, then you have this story to tell about how good he is. And so this witness ought to be constant. When we look at Psalm 34, look what David says. I will bless the Lord at all times. Not just sometimes. Not just when it's convenient. Not just when I don't feel awkward. But I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Like constantly in my mouth will be his praise. Have you ever really... You go just thinking back, you know, right now on your Thanksgiving meal. Now, maybe there was a dessert or maybe it was a side. Y'all know how much I love sides. I told you last week. Maybe there was something that when you, when you eat it, you know, I mean, the, the, the taste of it just explodes in your mouth. You know what I mean? It's just like, that is, you know, that's, that's heaven on earth. That is it right there. I'm sure that this will be in heaven when I get there. You know, it could be Mona's chest pie or that peanut butter you know, sheet cake that she made. And it's just like, oh my goodness, right? I can't believe it. And then after you've tasted it, right? After you've, it's gone. It's like you've consumed it. It's still there, right? It, it's still, it's just like, man. I just, you know, we, we've had this peanut butter sheet cake in my house, you know, since Thanksgiving. And for some reason, my wife decided to bless us and make you know, an abundance of it. So it's been sitting there. And so every time I get this sweet tooth, immediately I'm just like, hmm, you know, either chest pie or peanut butter, sheet cake. Which one am I going? I can taste it before I get to it, if you know what I mean. That David says, let his praise continually be on my path. Like, you taste his goodness no matter what the circumstances are. No matter what, you know, obviously it's easy to praise God when things are good, your family's around you, you're at Thanksgiving, you're hanging out, you're eating good food, praise the Lord. But in the midst of a dark cave, when people are trying to kill you and murder you, it's hard in the dark times of life. 
But what David is saying, I can still taste it. It's continually on my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. Like I no longer boast about anything else but the Lord. Because he's all that matters. He is my rock. He is my salvation. He is my stronghold. He is my refuge. He is my everything. All of my hope is in the Lord. So my soul doesn't boast that I killed Goliath. My soul doesn't boast on the things that I can do. They might sing songs about me. If you're familiar, they sang songs about David, how he could wipe out all these men, but Saul couldn't really wipe out as many as David could. And so people were jealous. And that's why Saul was after him. But to, despite this reputation he had, he's like, I don't boast in myself. I boast in the Lord. That is what's on my tongue continually. Our witness is constantly represented in our praise on how we talk about the Lord, how we, how we tell people of what he's done, how we, how we talk about his goodness. Oh, magnify the Lord. It says the humble will hear, hear and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. We must be constant in our praise. If our, if our witness is going to be constant, it starts with our praise. Everything that we do, we should be praising the Lord, praising the Lord. One of the greatest illustrations I think that we see of, it, see of this is in Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, you can turn there because I'm going to be there in just a second, but in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25, you see that Paul and Silas have found themselves in prison. And there in prison, the Bible says that in verse 25, that they are praying and singing. Like, the, when, when, when David says in verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times, that's Paul and Silas. They take that to heart. Even in the midst of this prison, we're blessing the Lord. His praise shall continually be on my mouth at midnight. They're like, we're not sleeping, we're praising. We're not sleeping, we're praying. Because of the circumstances we're in, uh, we're not going to let that affect you know, our praise. We are going to be constant with our witness. We're going to be constant with that opportunity. But what you see, David, next tell us is we need to be committed with our influence. Like we have to realize as we're constant with our as we're, as we're constant uh, with, the, with this message of the gospel and we present this witness as we're constant in that we have to be committed to the influence that we have. Like every single person in this room you have a sphere of influence. If you're sitting with somebody right now that's you know, part of your friend group or part of your family, that's a part of your influence right now. You're, you're sitting with your with people that, that are affected by your influence. People at your work are affected. People at your school are affected. One of the hardest things that I've, when, when dealing with students, and, and so I, you know, I understand some of the struggles like that Peter has, and one of the hardest things I, I always had dealing with students is actually getting them to understand the power of their influence. Like, they really don't see it. They see the power of other people's influences in their life, but they don't think that they have the power of influence on the people around them. We all have this power of influence, and we need to be committed to this influence that we have. David, look what he says in, in verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. I go back and, and I think about my personal salvation experience. Like the fact that God brought me up out of darkness into his marvelous light. But the fears that were set there before, like this, there's this enormous fear of death. As Christians, we don't need to fear death, right? Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? We don't fear it. Uh, that is taken away in that salvation process. Now, it doesn't mean like there, there might be a little, you know, well, I'm not sure how it's going to feel or what that transition is going to look like, but we don't fear the afterlife because we know where our hope lies. That fear is extinguished. David reminds us that in salvation, our fear is extinguished. And they looked at him, they looked to him, and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried. 
And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. I think what's interesting about this, when we think about this text and we think about what David's going through and what he's experiencing, if you go over to 1 Samuel chapter 22 and you begin to read through it, one of the things you'll realize is in the midst of his you know, running, in the midst of him running from Saul and running from the Philistines, hiding in the cave, there were 400 other people with him, including his family, like his dads and his brothers. They're there with him. That's his, that's his sphere of influence. He's got these people that he's influencing. And so what he's saying is, I, have, I, am, I find myself in this broken state. I'm scared to death, God. I sought you because I realized you're my only hope. You are where salvation lies. I need your help. I've seen you do it before, and I'm asking you to do it again. And God delivered me. He says in verse 6, this poor man cried. I want you to understand in the midst of your influence, in the midst of people hearing these praises that continually are on your lips, don't be afraid for them to actually see some, some authentic emotion. You know, some, some authentic feelings that you have toward God. It, it's, it's okay to be emotional when you've been saved by grace and nothing of yourself. When God has just bestowed this wonderful gift upon you, it's okay to get a little emotional about that. It's okay that when you're in this dark place in life and God pulls you out of it and saves you, when you reflect on it, it should create some emotion. And David's like, man, I cried out before the Lord. This poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. But in verse 5, he said, they looked to him. In the midst of this whole interaction that David's talking about, where he is crying out to God, where he is being delivered, where God is hearing him, there's other people watching. It was those 400 and the, the, this influence of praise, this influence of seeking God, this influence of God's hand upon David in this moment affected them and they looked to him. They, they're not looking to David, hey, you killed Goliath, get us out of this situation. They're not looking to their strong men. They turned their focus to God. This was the influence that David had in this moment. And they looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. Why? Because they have placed their trust and their faith in the Lord. And we're reminded when we go back into Acts chapter 16, verse 25. And again, we see at midnight, Paul and Silas in that prison. They have created this fear of influence, like they have gathered this, these people around them, and we don't know a lot. There could be some other Christians that are being persecuted and in prison with them, but at the same time, there could be murderers and thieves, you know, and abusers. There could be all kinds of, and they're around them, and look at what's going on. The Bible says in, in verse 25 of Acts 16, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. I think sometimes we don't realize the impact that we're having on the people around us. We don't really think that they're listening, but, but they do. I'm shocked sometimes. I'm shocked. I mean, I, I'll, I'll walk outside, and I'll be, I'll be sitting, sitting there and standing there and shaking people's hand, and, and just somebody will come up to me and say, Pastor, you said this, and I, I've been stuck in this, and that, and I was just thinking the whole time, I didn't think anybody was listening. <laughs> and they're like, you know, that really, that, that, that portion of scripture I've been really looking at already, and then you used it today, and oh, that was so special to me, God is, and they were listening, and I'm going, okay, I didn't think anybody, I mean, I never heard an amen or nothing, you know, I didn't think y'all were awake. But we sometimes don't realize People are paying attention. They're watching us. You know, I mean, if you want to really know something, you might not think this. Parents, your kids are watching you. you know, the, the prisoners of your home, because that's how they feel like, especially if they're teenagers, right? <laughs> they're watching you. They're watching how you react to situations. 
They're watching to see if that praise is continually on your mouth and on your lips. They're watching you. People are watching us. And we notice in this, that at midnight they're praying and they're singing hymns and praise to God. The prisoners were listening to them and suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison uh, house were shaken and immediately all the doors were open. Everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword, was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, don't harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for the lights and he rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out and said, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Not only were the prisoners listening, but I believe that Paul and Silas's praise were continually on their mouth. I believe they were continually doing this. I believe that, yeah, at that moment the guard was asleep, but he had heard this on and on and on. He had heard this message of Jesus. He had heard this message of grace. He had seen how the power of God shaped this place, right? And, he, and now he sees God's faithful men still standing in front of him like we didn't abandon you. Like we knew what would happen to you if we just took out and left. That's not what God's called us to do. And in that moment, that influence of, of their testimony, of, of who God is, that jailer looked and said, what can I do to be saved? What you have, I want and I need. What, 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 what you got, I need this. I need this Savior in my life. We have to be committed to the influences around us. We have so many opportunities. And then we continue in verse 7 and 8. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, David says. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is a man who takes refuge in him. We must have a compassionate pursuit of the lost. When we look at this, David at this point is filled with a compassion of if you have not experienced this, if you don't know, I want you to understand what God has done for me. That an angel of the Lord, he encamps around those, he surrounds those who fears him and he rescues them. David's like, I've experienced this rescue from God that only he can do. And I want you to taste and see it. I want you to experience this grace like I have, is what David is saying. He is, he is compassionate, and he is pursuing people to know this great and mighty God of grace. To know him in an intimate way. And, and we have to have that compassion we must pursue the lost in our influence. Those around us that we know have no idea who Christ is and what Christ can do, we must use that power of influence. We must have compassion and we must pursue them. Taste and see that God is good. Amen. Experience it. David is challenging us to experience this goodness that God offers. We must do a better job of allowing the praise that we have for the Lord to continually come out of our mouth, to continue no matter where we're at, no matter what we're doing. We have to be consistent and constant in our witness and the people around us these, that we influence, they need to hear these things. We need to understand that we have an obligation. We are called to be witnesses. The power of the Holy Spirit that indwells us will empower us to be his witnesses. We have experienced and seen the grace of God in our life. We need to be able to testify to people about how that has changed us. The 
the thing that is such a shame is that we can talk about grandma's peach cobbler and praise her cooking more than we can our Savior. I mean, we can explain the way a rich, delicious chocolate cake tastes and, and, and everything that we like about it, whether we like it moist or dry, whether we like a double layer of icing, we can explain the ingredients to it, but yet we can't explain and verbalize how good God is sometimes to people. And so we, we just, we sit in this silence and they never hear the praise. I believe that our silence is indicative to our relationship. Think about that. I believe our silence is indicative of our relationship. If you can sit in front of people that need God in a, I mean, they're dead in their trespasses and sin with no hope and they need a Savior and you have experienced all of that grace and goodness, how can you sit there in silence? says a lot about your relationship with Jesus. When Jesus has changed your life and he has rescued you, there is a song that should be sung from your soul. I mean, you should, it should be inside of you constantly on your lips, like David says in Psalm 107. The, the, the psalmist says this, verse 1, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of his adversary. Let the redeemed say so. Let the praise of the Lord be upon your lips. I'm not talking about you standing on a platform and preaching. I am talking about you just telling somebody that you know and have a relationship with how good God is and what God has done for you. Because there's people in this world that are hungering and thirsting and they don't know what they're hungering and thirsting for. And what's happening is the world is coming in ahead of us and laying out everything that they have, talking about how good it tastes, how, how satisfying it is, how you want to make yourself happy with all of these things. And the church is sitting back in silence. And we are saying that we have experienced God's grace and goodness. But is it coming off of our lips? Are we laying it out like the world lays out its treasures, saying this is what you want? No. We need to be compassionately pursuing the lost. They are hungering and thirsting. And Jesus, he tells us in John chapter 6, he's the bread of life. He is the bread of life. And those that come to him will no longer hunger or thirst. He quenches their hunger and their thirst. And when your thirst has been quenched, all you can do is say, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because you will never thirst again. That's what he told the woman at the well. Come and drink from what I have, and you will never thirst again. And those of us that have actually experienced that, we've got to be able to share it. We have to be able to share it. When we talk about Psalms, Psalms 34 is a great psalm when you look at it in the aspect of just salvation. And so is Psalm 40, probably my favorite. I love in Psalm 40 as it starts out, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined and he heard my cry and he brought me up out of the pit of destruction and out of the miry clay and he set my feet upon a rock making my footsteps firm. God, 
He pulled me out of that miry clay. He pulled me out of the sin that I was stuck in and dead in. He pulled me up out of that. He set my feet on solid ground, gave me life that I did not deserve. It goes on and it says, and he put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. And how blessed is the man who made the Lord his trust. When you have been rescued from the dominion of darkness and you have entered into his marvelous life only by his grace, he puts a new song into your heart. And that song we should never stop singing about the amazing grace that our God has bestowed upon us. That ought to be, that ought to be a tune stuck in our minds for our entire life and all of existence. His grace, his amazing grace, oh, how sweet the sound should be coming off of our lips. We should proclaim it. We should be living a life that exemplifies what Christ has done in us. And we should be singing that song. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word. Father, today you challenge all of us. You challenge me. Lord, you've given those, those in this room that know you, those in this room that truly have experienced this, the grace that you offer, we've tasted, we've seen it. We should be ashamed for not singing that song that you have given us every moment of our life. We should be ashamed to allow the praise that we have for the grace that you have given us to leave our lips. It should continually be there. But I've seen it, and I've seen it in my own life. And we let things in the world, things in life slip in and distract us and consume us. And we put you on the back burner. God, I'm sorry for that. I am sorry that I have done that in aspects of my life. I pray right now that, that you will convict the heart of your church that we need to walk out these doors today singing that song. The song of salvation, the song of grace. We need to sing that gospel song that people will know who you are and what you've done. But Lord, I, I pray right now for those in this room that they truly have never tasted this. They don't have a song to sing They've never really experienced your grace for whatever reason. Whatever reason, they put their faith in something outside of the redeeming blood of Christ. And today, what they need to do is taste for the very first time the grace that you freely offer. Today, they need to taste of it. So, Lord, I just pray right now, if there's anyone in this room truly does not know you. The grace that you offer, the salvation that you offer through the cross of your son Jesus and the life that you offer through his resurrection. Lord, I pray that today they will taste and see your goodness. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to stand as we sing this song together. Maybe you're here this morning and that's you. God gave you a new song months ago, years ago, decades ago. But for some reason, there's something in life that has silenced that melody. There's some, for some reason, the, the praise doesn't continually come from your mouth. And the people around you that, that you have the opportunity to influence, you just, you, they haven't heard you talk about Jesus too much. Maybe today we need to commit to the Lord that we're not going to allow that to happen anymore. We're going to allow that new song that the Lord has given us to be sung loud and proud. 
We want the people that are in our influence to hear it and to know who God is. And so maybe today, whether it be at the altar or at your chair, you just need to come to the Lord and just say, I'm sorry, but I want to sing. I want you to give me the courage and the boldness today to sing that song loud to everybody I can. And maybe it starts with some people in your family, some people around you. Maybe there's some people on your heart that you're like, I wish I should have done a better job just the other day at dinner in praising the Lord. And maybe you just need to pray for those folks that you know don't know Christ. And maybe you're here and you don't know Christ. Maybe you're, you're saying, I want to experience and taste his goodness. I want to, that new song. I've never experienced a new song in my life. I want that. And I want to know how, if you're like the Philippian jailer today, and you want to say, I want to know how I can have Christ in my life. I want to know how to be saved. As we sing this last song together, we will be, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to answer those questions. As we sing this song together, would you sing it out like the new song God has